Welcome to the session on New Work Style, Labor Market, and Deregulation. That's a long title. Uh, <laughs> even though I was introduced as a Professor Emeritus of Hitotsubashi, I am now freelancing. So I am uh, practicing the New Work Style. And I decided, uh, since this is an era for the individuals with the ICT and all these things, I, I, I have been sort of proposing and encouraging the younger generation to be unindependent and to develop skills and so forth. And finally I said, well, I'd better practice what I preach. So when I retired from KO last year, I decided not to belong to any organization and see whether that idea actually works. Because I think today is the, the prototyping and experiment. And so far, I'm having a great time. So I, I never thought that I would f feel as free as I do today. And I do a lot of things, but still, you know, it's, it's a very different feeling. I don't have to go to the other uh, sort of, uh, not stupid, but <laughs> non non-productive non -productive meetings and so forth. So I'm having a good time. And, but we'll see how, how it goes. And, but uh, today we, we would like to talk about new work style labor market and deregulation. As you know, I think the, uh, the, the labor market is in the flux of change. A lot of things are going on. We have demographics. We don't have that many working population, particularly in Japan and in other countries as well, some of the Asian countries. At the same time, we have technology. And uh, according to some of the studies, uh, in the US at least, 47% of the current jobs are gonna be gone, and half of it in the UK. So what are we gonna do? Does it uh, pose any threats or is that gonna be an opportunity? And I think, I, I personally think that's a great opportunity, but we have to go through the fairly fundamental change in many ways. And that's related to regulation as well. So we have this three panelists who represent each aspect of these things, particularly Mr. Asao, uh, he is going to enlighten us with what's going on in the labor regulation because that's a little bit confusing. One day it's reported something and the next day something was shelved so we don't know what's going on. And we have Lauren who used to be in the corporate world for a long period of time, very successful with four kids and that's an accomplishment to start with but she left and she has her own company and she has a great ideas for those who would like to follow her and who are interested in the opportunities. And Minami-san has been doing a lot of things for to give individuals the and the companies as well uh, new opportunities to, to match, to exchange and uh, by providing information. And he has quite a few uh, very interesting things to say. So let's start off with the, the Asao-san. If you could tell us a little bit about what's what's going on in the labor regulation <laughs> area. Okay. Well, um, uh, the conclusion is that the biggest de deregulation has not happened. That's the conclusion. <laughs> um, the, the the reason why I say that is that um, uh, there's the Supreme Court ruling in Japan that makes it very difficult uh, for corporations to fire people. Uh, and that only actually applies to big companies. Uh, if you are working for a small or mid-sized company, like uh, a company that, that has less than 100 employees, uh, it is typical that you are told, I'm sorry, uh, we're doing bad, so you're, you don't have to come tomorrow, you don't have any job, and um, he or she does not have any um, thing to say. And on the other hand, if you're working uh, for a big company, this happened uh, when Japan Airlines went bankrupt. Um, they, they tried to lay off people, but the uh, the employees sued the company by saying that no, no, we can still stand. No, you're you're going bankrupt, A and um, that's why uh, the the we have created this um, system where if you are working part time or a haken, uh, if you're, you're not really employed by that company, you you will be sent to that company for from other company, and and this is a buffer for um, uh, big companies to lay off people, and that that's that's not really uh, productive in a sense. I mean, uh, the real productive uh, if you change one, if you 
make the want to make the labor pro uh, market real productive, uh, you would have to have allow companies to lay off people by paying a certain amount of money. For instance, uh, about uh, say one year salary or two years salary, whatever that that has to happen. But uh, it's it, uh, the the uh, the biggest uh, resistance comes from those who are working in a big company with big labor unions, and also those who are the owner or presidents of uh, mid and small size companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it, it's like um, you're you're faced with both the biggest supporters of uh, Minshto and biggest supporters of Jiminto. That that the the uh, the owners of uh, mid and small size companies are usually uh, supporting the uh, politicians of LDP, and also la la uh, th those who are working for big labor unions are supporting. Uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, um, and therefore that has not happened, uh, but that has to happen uh, again to make the uh, the labor market really productive. Mm -hmm. And on one other issue that I would like to touch upon um, is about uh, foreign labor in this con uh, country. Um, uh, again, uh, we are trying to sort of uh, make a, a new category, uh, not just uh, directly granting a visa uh, to foreign labor, but you're, you're saying that um, if you want to be trained or educated uh, in, in certain field, you, you, you can work for five years. You, you have an uh, educational period, uh, for, for instance, building a big building. But if you have to be educated five years to uh, do the simple labor for building a big building, it, that's, that's really nonsense. I mean, you're not being educated, you're just being used. And um, so we, we have to face the problem and the, uh, the, the reality uh, and change uh, how it should be. But um, that is, again, being faced with uh, big resistance and therefore uh, it, it's, a, it's a way, uh, some of the deregulation is a way to uh, handle the issue uh, to a certain extent. And um, so I'll, I'll stop. Okay. Great, thank you very much to to get uh, us started. Let me go to Lauren. Uh, you have been in the corporate world and you left. And uh, tell us a little bit about how you feel now. So um, nice to be here today. Uh, I left the corporate world uh, after being um, really deep in it for uh, about 20 plus years. Um, I left actually to be a full-time mom. That was what I thought. And after three months, I was like, wow, this is like really boring. <laughs> um, no, I actually love it. Um, but you know, I went to a lot of lunches and kind of did lots of little tours and stuff. And I said, wow, this is really fun. But um, what am I really doing in my life? Um, but what I knew in my heart and why I left corporate was I didn't want to have my life controlled by many, many other people. I wanted to kind of seek my own destiny and, and have, quote unquote, some balance or some control of my life. Um, when I was on this break for a while, uh, I met so many intelligent women, and specifically Japanese women who I became close friends with, who were all graduates of the best schools, and their kids are now in high school or college, and they're bored out of their mind. And their only alternative I found, talking to many of them, was about being an assistant in a doctor's office or working at some kind of what they considered menial job. But they wanted to contribute more than that. Um, so I basically started Best Living as an information site. It still is right now, but we are going to be developing it into a marketplace of services that, um, not just for women, it can be any marketplace of services, but individuals. Well, they can say, I'm offering a calligraphy class, or I am you know, would take care of your teacher kid art, or whatever that person has a specialty in, we are going to create that marketplace in a bilingual environment. Um, you know, the goal isn't to do an IPO, the goal isn't to make a ton of money. I really, really want to take all these incredibly intelligent people who I see as underutilized in the marketplace and allow them to follow their passion. Uh, many of them don't want to work full time. Um, but if they want to work 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week in something they absolutely love, that's the goal. And actually, that's what I want to do with my life, and that's what I'm doing right now. So I think a lot of the discussion I've gone to today is about getting women back into the workforce. And I think that that's really great. I don't know if the 30% is the right quota to set there, how that will actually be done. I think there's a bigger problem with just enabling women um, 
a marketplace, and I think BizReach does that as well, to give them opportunity not to just have full time, but to do things where they can feel that they're adding value to society, that they're also challenging themselves intellectually because you can only do so many lunches. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of the mission I'm on right now. Uh, we just became a KK recently. So you know, over here, you've got a full-fledged business that's been up for five years. Um, we, we're, we're gonna move fast, but again, I don't want it a 16 hour a day job. And so we're, gonna, we're on this mission to have a great company, but to also strike a balance and empower women and, and other creative men. I've heard a lot, I'm excited about today, about the millennium and the younger Japanese population, boys as men as well, who want a balance in life. So I think there's this really exciting generation coming up, and I think it's gonna cause a huge increase. On foreigners, open the gates, let them in. Um, no, I mean, I, I think that it's not about are you a foreigner or are you Japanese. It's about having the best employees you can, having the talent that you need to become a global workforce. And I think Japan has um, got to find the right policy to enable that to happen. But I think there's a huge future here to really re-energize uh, the, co the country. Great. Much. Uh, what about Minami-san? You have been doing this biz reach, yeah. giving a lot of opportunities to people. Thank you. Um, yeah, we started up a company about six years ago, and uh, we're up to about uh, uh, 560 employees. So we're one of the faster startups here in Japan. And the, uh, the original mission I had um, originated from myself, basically. Um, after graduating from school, I've been in finance. I ran a professional baseball team. Uh, in Sendai as a founding member of the Rectane Eagles and now running my own internet startup. You know, I think uh, I wrote this book called Zettai Burenai Jiku no Sukurikata, meaning that I don't kind of blur around, <laughs> but I keep changing my uh, career uh, every five or six years because, you know, I, ran in, I run into these fun opportunities like uh, Lauren, uh, you know, and uh, you know, you, you want to do what you want to do. And uh, when I was looking for a job six years ago, and was looking for a job for the first time, I, I realized that there were so many positions if you're proactive and look around. Uh, there's so many options and opportunities you're to not just enhance, but entertain your career. And uh, you know, being brought up in the, uh, in the US and in Canada and having the opportunities to, uh, uh, to look around and to understand that you, know, you can be who you want to be that I felt that uh, there should be a platform for um, both professionals and employers to, uh, to, to reach each other. Um, so this is kind of realized by LinkedIn elsewhere in the world, but uh, you know, I felt that uh, how LinkedIn was doing it wasn't going to work here. So I built a closed kind of career networking service similar to that of LinkedIn. And uh, when you look at their P&L, it's 70, 80% of their revenue is coming from employers and recruiters using the database to tap into the market. I think we've created that same direct sourcing. Uh, the big bottleneck is not people, actually. The, direct, uh, the big bottleneck is, uh, is companies. And the company's not looking for the best people, not looking for the best talent. You know, not being proactive in trying to reach out and to secure you know, human capital to uh, enhance uh, the business activities of one's company. Uh, so that's the big bottleneck that we're trying to kind of solve. Uh, that's kind of like the big bottleneck that uh, Hiroshi Mikitani solved for uh, in the retail market by going out to you know, manufacturers and retailers and distributors and, and empowering them to use the internet, using technology to get more products. Amazon, same thing. It's always that side of the business that's the big bottleneck. So we're not going out and reaching out to companies, especially companies in local cities, Osaka, Nagoya, and Fukuoka, we, where we've set up offices because there's a huge need for top talent there. And companies are realizing. Companies are realizing that you can get the top talent if you are proactive and sell yourself, promote the job, and create a better workplace uh, for people to work in. So that's what we're looking at right now. And uh, it, it's, it's a great time. Great time to be uh, in kind of the employment market doing business here because it's changing. When there's change, there's opportunities. So look forward to talking to everybody today. Okay, great. Thank you very much. It seems like, uh, let me ask you, you uh, because I think all of them are sort of realize that there are so many different ways to do. And there's not a big deal to change. But I know that n that's not shared by a lot of people. And uh, unless you realize that there are a lot of options and opportunities, you just, you just kind of, you, you get much more scared of losing what you have. 
And so you avoid change, and that gets into this whole cycle. So uh, let, me, let me ask uh, some of you who are sort of, uh, who may have been looking for other opportunities, and if that's the case, what are the, the obstacles? Is that much more of a mentality, or is it much more like information and so forth? Are you awake? <laughs> <laughs> Or is that too much of a provocative question? A little bit, yes. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, pretty much uh, I've been on the lookout because of, yeah, several reasons. And I'm actually a BizRich user, which I found to be an amazing platform. It's really, really something else. It, it touches places that LinkedIn has no way to get. So uh, anyway, what I've, uh, going to the question, I think, yeah, definitely, as a foreigner, yeah, uh, that's one of the biggest issues, not necessarily um, within the companies, but pretty much within the foreigners' mm -hmm. mentality. Uh, many companies do believe that foreigners cannot adapt to the Japanese uh, work style, but probably the uh, uh, biggest issue that I've seen is that many foreigners do believe that. Uh, there's this inherent, uh, I don't know, anomaly going on that many foreigners do believe, no, we cannot adapt. And many people don't even want to adapt. So, uh, I don't know, that's one of the things that I've seen so far. There was no question, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lauren, probably you can talk a little bit about this uh, whole sort of notion of you know, once th there is just so many mentality, mindset, cultural sort of focus, and this is the way it's being done. So, if even though it's in the in the state of change, people still belong to this older sort of mentality, and things don't change. So, if we could just uh, talk a little bit about. Yeah, I mean, I I think every single company is different. Obviously, um, my experience at Amazon is. It was all about changing everything. <laughs> so th I think I was kind of in an extreme case where you weren't expected to act a certain way. But I did work for a Japanese company a long, long time ago. I don't know. I, I think um, you have to uh, you have to listen. Uh, you have to respect whether you're foreign or Japanese. It, it really comes down to respect and listening. And then I think w the key in Japan for me as a foreigner has just been persistent. Uh, be persistent and it takes longer yes things take longer um, but that is also because Japanese don't want to make a mistake and that's something that's also incredibly valuable in the society here is the attention to detail um, and so there's a hard part as probably a foreigner that it, things take longer the good side is when they are decided they're usually better decisions I've found how do you get the foreigners uh, how do you get that point across to foreign people? Uh, I, we've been running a little uh, club here to help actually the students get jobs in Japan, and that, that's pretty much what we've been repeating. Mm. It does take longer. Mm. You have to be, you have to wait a little longer, you have to wait, you have to try harder, you have to get used to getting denied mm. a lot more than outside. So how, do you, how have you succeeded to get this point across? I think you actually, as going back to your student side or looking for a job, you, you need to be strategic about where you're going to try to get into, first of all. Like there are some companies that it's not worth your effort to even try to get into those companies. Mm -hmm. I think there's a high correlation, Yagi-san, at the, the last session I attended from Lixel, he's the head of HR there. That would be a company that I think, you know, they're all big on diversity right now. I mean, gay, lesbian, you know, Caucasian, you know, all different diversities, everything, women, doesn't matter. They just want diversity. So uh, that's a company that you should target, that you should hit up. So I think if you look at once these diversity statistics are made public, which will happen in the spring, if I was in the market to, as a younger person trying to find a job, a foreigner in Japan, I would hit up those higher diversity companies. Uh, would be my strategy. Uh, if you see someone low on female diversity, they're not going to be hiring foreigners either. <laughs> so, you know, go the path of least resistance has always been, you know, my, my strategy there. Um, but some companies, yeah, don't, don't even bother you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Minami-san, you have uh, 
so many people, individuals, uh, registered. How is that majority Japanese? Yeah, basically, it's uh, you know we're we're kind of specifically targeted at professionals mm-hmm. uh, above a certain kind of. Uh, corporate rank kind of thing. So I'd say 99% of our registered users are, we have about a half a million, about six 600,000 uh, registered professionals. But yeah, most of them are Japanese uh, because most of our, the employees that uh, use our company are Japanese companies or Jap- Tokyo branches of you know foreign companies. So yeah, we haven't opened up the, uh, the corporate side. It always starts from the corporate side, mm-hmm. all these platforms, I think. Um, and change in, in the labor force, I mean, it's, it's very interesting because if you look at the history of the U.S., I mean, everyone talks about the U.S. in terms of employment. If you go back 30 years ago, the U.S. was a very lifelong employment country. Mm. In terms of diversity, mm. you know, according to some research or reports that I saw in the 70s, the U.S. had lower female participation in the, in the labor force than Japan. So uh, the U.S. has changed a lot. And if you look at the history and how, how it's changed, it, it happens from the corporate side. You know, in the 80s, the U.S. was a very manufacturing-driven country and, you know, a country with a low labor cost uh, that was good at manufacturing came into play, which was Japan, and it killed U.S. manufacturing. And the U.S. had to change to more service-oriented countries. And with that, uh, along with more financial institutions owning companies, uh, companies were forced to raise productivity. And what uh, happened was, uh, it was a very interesting case, was IBM fired a lot of people, um, you know, in this probably six figures. And with that, what happened was they went into a more productivity kind of uh, labor practices in the country or in the company. And through that, you know, the relationship between corporations and employees changed. And companies were forced to give better compensation, better conditions to the top, you know, the higher productivity employees if you didn't have higher productivity, you had to leave. So what happened, it, it, vice versa, it, it created a good ecosystem where top talent were getting paid well, better condition, people were trained to be better employees, higher productivity, and the employment kind of uh, conditions of the environment changed over the last 30 years. So, you know, Japan, it's going to take time. I mean, you know, these laws that you know, I think I saw some in the government's working on, I think this is what exactly what the U.S. went through 30 years ago in the 80s. So, you know, even firing people. You know, I, I mentioned to the, uh, the you know, Koro show the other day, they asked me my, uh, my, uh, my opinion on what they should about firing people. You know what? You shouldn't fire people. You shouldn't be able to fire people because the society promised that. But we didn't promise these college grads that we were going to have lifelong employment for them. So... Please tell Kedanren, you know, that these college grads coming out of school, they should all have one-year contracts. Because my last company, I was running a baseball team. The, 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 the people that work the hardest in my 15-year career are the baseball players because they all have one-year contracts mm-hmm. coming out of school or mm-hmm. coming from a Shakai Jin. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it takes time, 20, 30 years. Mm-hmm. One generation should ta- change the mentality mm-hmm. of both a corporation and vice versa. In essence, uh, the the professionals working in the labor force. Uh, Minamisa, you mentioned that the, the corporate side is the, the the factor. What exactly drive the Japanese companies to register and to sort of use your service? Is that the, for the productivity or? Yeah, I think you know the, everyone's starting to realize that uh, change is moving fast. I was actually um, uh, brought in by uh, one of the subsidiaries of Toyota. Uh, and one of their HR directors, and I, <laughs> I went to Kariya City, which is in Boonland in Aichi, right? <laughs> and I went because I wanted to know why they wanted, they wanted to talk to me, um, or wanted to talk to us. And I asked the question, hey, you're a lifelong employment, new grad kind of company. What's happening? And it was very interesting. He said, Minami-san, last 50 years, we've been making cars run by gasoline. So we wanted mechanical engineers. Last five years, th- the main uh, manufacturing is hybrid. So we need electronic engineers. But we know that in five years, it's going to be electric cars. So we need electrical engineers. The people running our factories are around 40 years old, the managers and above. 15 uh, year old players uh, that they brought in 15 years ago. We only have mechanical engineers. I need electronical engineers. I need electric. I want Toyota. I want Toshiba, Hitachi engineers. Mm-hmm. I want Microsoft engineers. Mm-hmm. 
and w- it ca- the the ev- uh, evolution of technology is so fast mm. that this 40 year cycle of hiring from a new grad mm. to retirement mm. doesn't work anymore mm. and toyota uh, even toyota is realizing that and it's fascinating that uh, you know companies who are more early adapters are realizing and trying to change so you know i'm i'm not uh, afraid i mean i'm not uh, you know worried too much that uh, you know if we have a good open market kind of uh, economy that companies will start realizing but when you show them the database and they're like wow because in the past they didn't realize they had access to top talent mm. it was basically th- a black box recruitment agency bringing them five people and say here here are only five people that are interested but in actuality you have 500 people who are actually op- uh, interested in the position if you provide that information mm. and people are people are faster to adapt mm. like e-commerce if you provide a good platform of good product, ch- cheaper product, mm. good logistics coming to your door, people will buy. It's the same as jobs. If the corporations open up, you know, their doors and the information to people working, the top talent will s- be proactively looking for positions. So, you know, that's what we're working on. It takes time. Mm. Like e-commerce is only 4% of retail in Japan. It takes time. And I think what we're doing trying to liquidate through opening up you know, options and opportunities mm. from the corporate side. I think that's the key to changing Japan. Mm. So I think at least we heard this, how quickly the technology has changed, and uh, is changing, and in order to survive and prosper, I mean, the businesses, they have to adapt. And so they, n- they definitely need uh, big talent, you know, good talents. I wonder, uh, the government or the politicians, how they react to these things. Usually the corporations go, f- you know, fast, but the government is just kind of trying to catch up, and uh, not necessarily with the uh, the the pace of change. Well, I, I think the um, uh, the issue is who is protected under the current regulation and who is n- who is not protected. And uh, those who are protected will probably resist to changes. And those who are not protected, or those who will benefit from the changes, cannot see the future. So they, they, they can't become, uh, they usually don't become big uh, supporters of change. And that's, that's the biggest uh, obstacle. Uh, for instance, um, technologies has changed a lot. Um, uh, like uh, not just in Japan, but in, in, in uh, globally, uh, there's a service uh, like a- Airbnb or Uber. Um, but like if you talk about Uber, um, that's against um, uh, taxi rules in Japan. Uh, or Airbnb, it's it's against um, um, uh, hotel laws. Um, but I mean the internet and um, C to C or whatever you call it was not there. Uh, 10 years ago, mm. but now it's there, and it, it's, it, it, it provides much better service. So as a consumer, you should benefit. Mm. And, you know, if you're not pr- providing good service, I mean, like, high-end hotels will not compete against Airbnb. Mm. So they, they shouldn't be uh, afraid of pr- Airbnb, probably. But if you're, you know, if you're not really productive, but you're just running your business, and then you, I, all of a sudden you might lose your job, then you will be r- resist. And again, um, if you are, you know, if you th- believe that you're protected uh, through regulation, then you, you will, you know, become very uh, fierce about uh, n- not allowing the, regula- the, mm. the, the regulation. So it's not the uh, government or, or the, um, uh, it, it is actually the government and also the, um, the politicians, but, mm. uh, I think it's 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 both ways. I, uh, from my side, we should come out and sort of um, utilize the unknown uh, magma mm-hmm. of deregulation uh, to achieve certain kind of deregulation, so that the consumers can benefit mm-hmm. from this kind of deregulation. Um, that's like a, a starting venture in the in the political f- arena, but um, that's usually is not really successful because uh, from our side, we can't sell this idea that well. Uh, and and I, th- I think it should come out both ways. Like from the consumer side, um, 
they, there should be a voice that, I, I, I use this Uber service in San Francisco, and it was very good. Oh, why can't I use it in, in Tokyo, for instance, like that? Mm -hmm. and, and if that kind of voice comes out, mm -hmm. then uh, things would uh, happen. And it, although it's slow in Japan, it, it, it should happen. Mm -hmm. okay. It seems like the, the vested interest group has uh, the strongest voice, and they, they definitely do resist any, any change with which they they lose the, uh, the their vested interest and but the the world is changing so quickly Lauren you had something I used uber last night yeah, yeah I and my husband and I were going to an event we walked out to the street we waited for like 15 minutes we're dressed up to go and the cab wasn't coming and he's like let's just call uber two minutes uber's there so go uber um, <laughs> I'm also an Airbnb user um, I, technology cannot be stopped. It, it is the biggest enabler to information services. It is the most, it is awesome. And regulation will exist. I, th I feel the government's role, ultimate role, is to keep us safe. Keep everyone safe, to provide a, a support system for people who are in need. I think that in some ways, the government's got to get off some of the, these hang-ups that I'm seeing from a consumer perspective. Um, I really, I think it, what's gonna be really awesome in Japan is getting, th what I'm seeing that's so exciting is the younger generation, and also people my age who have left corporate and are starting up these ventures. I mean, you see in Shibuya and other Yokohama, there's a, a building now just for women who are starting companies. There's a new place I haven't been to yet down near Shibakoen that's an incubator for just for women. So you start to have these facilities that are being built. Um, some of them actually have child care centers that are being attached to them where people can start to be around other individuals who are starting their own companies and feed off of each other. I mean, just meeting today, I've learned so much. You need to be in that environment. And so technologies, communities, facilities, you know, meet up online, getting that going is gonna be such a momentum. Japan has been behind in that area, I think, versus Silicon Valley and places. So that's very exciting to be involved in and, and see that going forward. And um, I think that, People, whether you're in Tokyo or whether you're out in the, the rural areas, I went to an Airbnb seminar the other day, and there was this 68-year-old old man, and he was signing up for Airbnb. And I said, what are you signing up? He goes, this is my parents' farmhouse. I'm going to list on Airbnb. And I'm like, it, that's so cool, right? And so you're going to start to see people in rural areas as well. I have another Japanese friend who's a retiree who has started up a – um, natural farm co-op in Nagano of handicap employees. Every employee is a handicapped Japanese citizen who is involved in bringing the vegetables in, they sell them online. Those types of new creative internet endeavors using technology is really exciting. And I think it's, we have to as consumers vote by putting our money into those places. You know, the last seminar, they, they said, you know, if companies don't hit diversity r numbers, don't use that company. No matter if the product's cheap or not, don't use that company. Put your money into companies that you truly believe in, you know? And I, I think that's a message that when you go to the supermarket as mom, you wanna buy the cheapest vegetables. But the truth is that might not be the best company to be buying their vegetables. Um, and so I think Japanese consumers as well um, need to start voting with their money uh, to also move things forward. But technology is the enable of that because it's going to give us the information that we need. Um, and I think the C2C market, which is what I'm going into as well, um, is just so exciting here in Japan because it's behind other countries, but it's going to catch up really fast. I think one of the things that I've heard so far is that like shared economy rather than owning and also the community kind of idea information playing a significant role, connecting people who are in need and who, are, who have some stuff. Sometimes what I sort of wonder is, and I was at the, the other uh, conference a couple of days ago and in terms of how the technology and all these things are perceived by the top management of the large corporations in Japan, and they just don't get it. So <laughs> I'm just wondering whether you know, that, it, it, that's partially my impression. And uh, partly because uh, the world today is too, so different from when they were young. 
So unless you sort of understand what, uh, you know, what's, what's so good about sharing and Airbnb and Uber, I mean, I, I remember that I was talking to the top management of the auto companies and all of them love cars. So they just had no idea why the young people don't buy cars. And says, well, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's your world. It's a very different kind of things. And it's very difficult for them to get it. And I'm just trying to figure out whether there is any good way or and we have to wait until they just kind of leave. And <laughs> I, I realize that, you know, Minami-san and others have mentioned that it takes time. But, I mean, we have been waiting for quite a while. <laughs> and the technology is moving along so so fast. So, any thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I, I, on exactly that, it takes time. I think that it is really very dangerous to continue to say, I think it is very dangerous for us to continue to say that it takes time and we have time. And I'll give you a couple of anecdotes. My daughter just graduated from college in America. She's a Japanese passport holder. She and all of her friends who are Japanese don't want to work in Japan. Why? It's too hard. It takes too much time. I want responsibility faster. I want to have flexibility. I don't want to be pegged into a position. And I will tell you that even companies that we would perceive to be cool Japanese companies have already fallen into the trap of structure and hierarchy and you must do your time. Uh, and uh, I don't think that young people will do that. I have been sponsoring a scholarship at Harvard Business School for a Japanese student, and, you know, an unsponsored Japanese student. Five years in a row, that student, five different students, stayed in the United States. I have to say I consider that somewhat of a failure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not happy with that outcome, but I think that it is because we have this mentality that it takes time. We have more time. I don't think we have more time. You know, if the Japanese elite in the Meiji Revolutionary period had said, you know what, it's going to take time, uh, Japan would not have defeated Russia in 1905. It would not have become a major industrial power by the 1920s. We do not have time. Now, the challenge, of course, is that it requires root and branch change, which Japan has done before. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that we have to think harder about that, uh, even though that that is difficult. Now, of course, in the Meiji period, you know, they finally saw all these things going on in the world. They had a panic attack, and they decided to act. Or in 1945, the country was devastated, and there was no alternative. I don't know what the, in, you know, what, what is the event that will, you know, make that change. Um, but I would say, to be more positive about it, that I have not seen, you know, in the 30 plus years that I've been in Japan, as much of a consensus at the top that we have a problem, we have to do things, identify an agenda. Let me be honest, you know, we can have various opinions politically about the Abe administration, but at least, you know, there is a, uh, an enunciated plan for reform. For example, one, uh, you know, plan uh, across the board for reform of the economy, which, for example, does not exist in the United States of America. Well, so uh, I don't think we have that much time. <laughs> so, and I mean, that's, that's how I feel, and that's how I'm, uh, I'm just getting very impatient. And we, we keep saying, you know, it's going to take time, but at the same time, sometimes I find the young people get s sucked into that mindset once they join the other big corporations. And whenever I see that, I feel like it's not going to change, <laughs> even though these old guys leave. So that's what I'm very much afraid of. Any positive? <laughs> As a, a student of uh, Terry Porte's school at Morgan Stanley, as a first year student uh, 16 years ago, I'm happy that I'm still working in Japan, that I've created uh, uh, 600 jobs uh, through my company. But, you know, I think uh, uh, Terry's point, you know, I totally agree with every single point. I think if you, you know, 
I'm a big fan of history, like I've uh, talked about the U.S. history. I think Japan has only changed, you know, the many times that it's changed, whether it was Kentoshi or Kenzushi back a thousand years ago or, you know, Nobunaga, uh, you know, e evolving through the imports of guns and, you know, Meiji Restoration or, you know, post-World War II. I think uh, this country has changed through foreign influence or through people who have seen what the future of Japan should be whether it was in Western, or whether it was in Europe, US, or in like Takasugi's case, Shanghai. You know, I think people uh, need to see the outside world. Um, the internet, yes, yes, is changing, but we have this Japanese language problem that prohibits us from seeing the real world through world media. But I, I think, you know, uh, again, education, teaching uh, our, our younger Japanese to see the world, you know, I'm part of uh, the Ministry of Education's reform of, of high schools, of globalizing high schools, as well as, you know, helping the uh, the exchange program uh, run by their uh, new exchange program, Tobitata Japan. But, uh, you know, I'm a big investor in, in, you know, education of young people. I'm not, it's easier to change younger people than trying to change older people. And like what I mentioned before, hey, why does not, the, instead of trying to change the entire landscape of employment and employment laws for people in their 30s, 40s, and even 50s and 60s who have a bigger stake uh, in, 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 in not changing, uh, why don't we go out and go to college kids and say, or like I said before, Kay Darren, and say, hey, give everyone a one-year contract. Make everyone a hiseki shine or a non perm employment uh, in Japanese terms. I mean, that because that's what full time employees in the US are. It's basically in Japanese terms, it's a non perm employment. They have, you know, no kind of obligations to continue hiring. So for me, if you want to speed up the uh, of, uh, mother time, I think it's easier to reform and invest into the uh, younger generation now. Let me. Uh take some of the questions or uh, comments from the floor. I mean, you have heard sort of very positive stories uh, and experiences of the panelists. At the same time, we, we sort of realize that it's, we keep saying it takes time and not a whole lot has changed. And uh, we, we can always, you know, invest in the younger generation. But I mean, you are sort of, you're not necessarily high school kids, but you're in the sort of labor force. So how do you feel about this whole sort of very positive, but is, is that something that's so distant and you can't really reach? Or do you see some changes taking place around you? Go ahead. I think uh, I'm working for um, yeah, very conservative. Here is a Japanese company, a trading company, and I'm working in HR department. So, in my personal opinion, uh, we should change more rapidly. But uh, as I see in the uh, within the company, there are many top executives whose mind hasn't been changed. However, I can see the positive um, trends in the younger generation. Uh, they started to open their mind to um, outside. And even Japanese company is very secured. And yeah, we offered um, high compensation and benefit. They are looking for uh, more better companies to to uh, work vividly. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it takes time, I think, but uh, it I can see the positive trends mm -hmm. a little bit. What do you think uh, will drive those changes more? What, what are the kind of things we could do? I think you see the, the, the good change, I mean, good sign among the, the younger generation, but we really have to support them. Otherwise, they get killed sooner or later, they get tired and just get killed. And so what are the kind of things that we as a society could do? As a society? <laughs> Maybe uh, one of us, yeah, each of us uh, should uh, make effort to, um, to, what can I say, widen our perspective to outside mm -hmm. and to show that uh, we are 
uh, working vividly uh, than in the conservative uh, company or um, that we should show that uh, positive positive change mm. uh, as an individual. Okay. Very good. Uh, as a matter of fact, I am writing the, uh, the short piece for hopefully to be on Keizai Kyosu of Nikkei because I'm on the board, uh, I'm on the, uh, the Committee of Future of Jobs of World Economic Forum and I'm very concerned about this whole technology and things like that. And one of them is that I essentially said that the, uh, the top management of the big corporation should get out of this traditional way of hiring, you know, from the, the undergrad and just once and just they, they just follow this fixed uh, way of promotion, not given any responsibility for the first five years or whatever, and just give a lot of opportunities for them to express their views regardless of the, the, the position and regardless. And uh, right now I'm, I'm going to be using this opportunity to do a little bit of uh, promotion but I run this thing called Davos Experience in Tokyo series, which, is ta which takes place every month. And I've run it uh, over two years. And this is the opportunity for anybody can come to join the discussion on the, the, the any topic that they like. And this time, I think last uh, two weeks, uh, 10 days ago, we did LGBT. And we said, well, how can we create a society where everybody, regardless of my, uh, nationality, background, gender, uh, sexual preference, feels included? And that was the topic. And uh, this time in October, we're going to be doing the sustainability. What do we mean by sustainable? It's not just an environment. We're talking about human as well. And we're going to do it at Unilever. And uh, I'll be also running the, the Global Agenda Seminar Series at the, the Ropongi Hills, and that's where people can come and discuss how they can brand themselves. Because I'm, I believe that individuals can self-brand and position themselves. As we talked about, you know, who are we, which way we, we want to do, what kind of life we want to have. And they need experience and the opportunities. And I'm firmly convinced if you give them the opportunities, they can do. It just is a matter of they don't, they haven't been given the opportunity. And you need a little bit of practice, but people can do it. And so, I mean, these things are very small scale, and yet I think I, I'm much more con encouraged than before because we have quite a few of those people who are interested and who actually do come on Friday night. I, mean, I said, you guys have nothing else to do? <laughs> on Friday night, <laughs> but they do. So, uh, I mean, it's if you could do something like that, I think that'll be great. Other comments, questions? Go ahead. I'm very happy to hear you all very optimistic. I'm not so optimistic. I've been in Japan for, for 10 years and worked in three different companies, and I think actually that Many companies like to change, but cannot change because it's not possible to fire people, as mm -hmm. was said earlier. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, from a uh, law perspective, it should be easier for companies to, to let people go. And it would actually be a win-win situation because now you have people who's not productive and who's not uh, motivating and just uh, not uh, helping society or, or themselves. Uh, on top of that, uh, it could be considered to, if companies can let people go in, a, in an easy way in, in a one year time or so, that then the people who is let go will have like a half year or one year full unemployment insurance or something mm. like that. Then it could be like a win-win situation. Mm. But I think until the, the law really, really helps companies, then uh, then the labor market will not be as effective as it is in, in Europe and the U.S. Mm. Uh, so, son, you have, uh, yeah. Well, um, there are many um, solutions to what has been discussed. Uh, and uh, first of all, um, I think the key word is diversity. And also, you, when, when you talk about the diversity, it's you have to look at um, industry uh, by industry. In, in other words, some industry in Japan compete globally. 
And if you are talking about big companies competing globally, the, 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 um, the rules should be a uh, global de facto standard. And also, I, um, many um, jobs come, come from lo only companies that, that are competing locally. Like 90%, or I should say 70% of the, uh, se more than 70% of Japan, Japanese jobs comes from service sector who only competes uh, locally. And many of the, um, the local giants are monopolies in those uh, sectors. Um, and if you are a monopoly, like, like a, a bus company, then uh, usually if you, if you have good management, you can make certain profits. And um, to make, to have these uh, local companies be more productive, you would want to have less uh, competitive, less productive local companies to go out of business uh, and th that would not uh, create recession because job to applicant ratio for um, bus drivers, construction workers, um, all the job uh, except for quote unquote white color jobs is uh, above two. And therefore, if you lose companies, you, you might lose the, the, uh, the position of president, but you won't lose um, uh, the jobs. And to create that, what you, what you can do, what the government can do is just raise the minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And because, I, you know, if, it's, if the job to applicant ratio is above two, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's, uh, it's been raised, um, I, those productive ones will, will remain. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when you talk about the, those companies that, that I, I think the, um, the, the, the companies that you have mentioned will, will be uh, trying to compete globally. I, I said trying, maybe they're not as, as much as they, they sh could have. Um, then you, you have to have a management, uh, again, uh, a management that would have um, gays, lesbians, uh, Caucasian, blacks, whatever, uh, and ha have a diverse management and have uh, a different set of language. It may be a language like in Lockdown, uh, you might want to use English if you want to, uh, if, you're wa if you want to compete globally. So the, the sets have to be two sets. There's a clear distinction between global and local, and local really plays a significant role. And that's we we tend to sort of talk about the global global companies and you know need so and so and so. But there are local and services have to be local. Well, one anecdote that that might uh, convince you. Um, just imagine whatever convenience store that you use uh, when you go to work workplace. Even if there's a, fifth, a convenience store different than you use usually, uh, like l let's say there's a Lawson right next to or 50 meters across the street from 7-Eleven, uh, you would probably only use 7-Eleven 90%. Therefore, uh, you know, th there's a small monopoly in that certain area. And so the service is, 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 has a different set of rules. And the service sector in the locals uh, have um, a way to use this uh, quasi-monopoly for uh, to enhance their uh, productivity. And I think you also mentioned that there isn't any law as such not to be able to, for the companies not to fire people. Is that correct? So I think that's a very important thing, right? That's right. Um, there's only Supreme Court ruling. And uh, since there is a Supreme Court ruling, uh, once you are fired and if you go to a court, and if the companies that you you were fired, a big one, they, they would probably, if, they, if you go to court, mm -hmm. they know that you, you're going to lose, so they, 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 they would change their mind. Mm -hmm. But if you are working for a small and mid-sized company, uh, usually the employees don't go, go to court, and therefore mm -hmm. y you're, you're free. I guess one of the things is that, uh, getting back to Minami-san's point, if we can make the, the, the contract annually renewed, like the board of directors, <laughs> probably we can change. We can change it much more quickly, and that's the very good way. If we have to renew it every year, the, the management has to uh, look at each employee much more closely so that they know they can judge whether they should renew or not. So that will change the whole scene, the whole flow. Yeah, you know, I think it's a uh, it's a matter of, you know, w what are you trying to do, you know, as a society or as a country. I mean, I think, you know, I get this question a lot from 
uh, like Kei San Shou, uh, you know, that are trying to, you know, uh, push more startups into the to the society, right? My question to them is all is is always the same. Why why do you want to support startups? You know, do you, do you just want to do it because it's fashion? You know, I think startups are supposed to be supported to create jobs. You know, and that that that's my answer to them all the time. Do you want to start? You want to help? It's great that you know the government supporting these one man, two man, three man startups. But in, in actuality, if you want to create jobs, it's better to support a 300 or a 500 or a thousand person startup and try to take that to 10,000. You probably create more jobs uh, in a be- if through investment that way. What I'm trying to get at is, is, is the same question. Wh- why do you want to fire people? You know, why do you want to raise productivity? It, it comes back to basically what do you want to do as a society, as a country, right? And uh, my, my answer is very simple. You want to make people happy. You know, you want to make people happy. Higher product productivity for companies make people happy. I think whether work for like uh, work life uh, balance make people happy. You know, wh- where where are we trying to go? I think there's really no set goal or agenda uh, with this de- 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 uh, deregulation employment talks as a country. Is the U.S. a best role model for us? Is Europe the best model for us? You know, Japan has the most uh, the concentration of hundred year companies. 100-year-old companies, I think it was like 70%. I forgot what the percentage was, but I was fascinated by this number. I mean, wh- where do you want to go? Is productivity really, as Japan, the best way to be happy as a society or a country? I think that's the question I want to ask you. You know, I think we always talk about, you know, e- economic kind of, you know, you change your job because of different kind of, you know, situations and goals and targets, right? And wh- what do you think, Lauren? I, I want to ask you your I question. Don't, uh, happiness is, you know, William Fellerable song. I mean, w- what is happiness, right? Everybody's definition. I think human beings are driven by value. And you want to wake up in the morning and feel like you're adding value, whether that's value to your, f- your kids, whether that's value to your husband, whether that's value to your corporation or whatever. I always said to my employees, if you wake up in the morning and you lie there in bed when I think you're the rawest kind of like birth and you go, I don't want to go to work. You should quit that day because that is the true emotion that you hold inside of you. And you will not add anything to not just your life, but to the people that you work around. And so the biggest challenge, and you know, there's government or whatever, I see in Japan is actually people are not investing in what I would say continuing learning. And I think Globus is a great example of that that, that's really found a niche there because people want to learn and see it as an opportunity to propel themselves. A lot of these women I speak to who are, you know, potentially going to be on the platform, they don't know where to go to learn a new skill. There is no place for them to actually pivot. Life is about pivoting. I've just pivoted, right? If you want to go from corporate world and you want to go and, and do something different, there needs to be more opportunities. In America and Europe, you have more c- community college. You have more opportunities to go at night and learn something. The biggest challenge in Japan is lack of those places, but also you have to work till 9 o'clock at night, so you actually can't go to those classes. So it's a, it's a shared ownership, but uh, it actually comes to down to what is your value and to stop making excuses for why you can't do something. Suck it up, save your money, you know, quit your job, and go pivot, and you'll find a way to do it. Um, and I think that it's very easy to say that government needs to do this or corporations need to do this, but I was with a big corporation, and everybody thinks Amazon, and I'm sorry, I know there's some employ- employees here, but everybody thinks it's just such a trendsetter, it does everything. They scan resumes also of Shin Yu Shine coming in. I was horrified. I said, what do you mean you're scanning? If it doesn't say KO or Todai or whatever on it, it just goes out. And I'm like, seriously? Like, why aren't we hiring kids who go to Yale or kids who are or accidental or whatever in America? Oh, we can't hire those people. Like, we don't know if they'll fit back into our... I'm like, we're a friggin' American company. What are you talking about? <laughs> so I totally agree that you can be the most American company, but you get sucked in because of senior management that's in place. That this is the way we need to do it in Japan. You know what? It, it comes down to let's value ourselves. Let's value people for who they are, not what university they came out of, because I'll tell you, after 14 years, 13 in Japan, I don't see a lot of correlation me coming out of Todai and being a great e-commerce entrepreneur or doing your own thing. So I think, you know, I, I want to hope that the government policies and things like that help, but I really think it comes down to personal ownership mm. and making a change. And, you know, when I left Amazon, it was one of the saddest days of my life because I really, really enjoyed it and I love the people there. 
But I also wanted to send a message, I hope a little one, to say you can do something else and it's okay and it is scary, but you've got to like lose that support system and go make change. So there's got to be other people doing that. Um, and so I don't know what's going to happen with my company. We're trying to make a go for it, but it's just about creating change mm -hmm. and to try to, try to stimulate something. Um, so you, you can go after the corporations. I'm not interested in them. Um, I'm going to try to figure out how to get more um, independent people into the employee market. And you gambate in the <laughs> government there. And, and maybe all of us together, we can make a big change. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> And I think it's, uh, you know, value is uh, such an important concept. And I think you were talking about earlier, you know, how do we define success? Yeah. What do we mean by, you know, being successful? And I think each one has a, his own uh, definition of success. And But we get so bogged down with this sort of definition, ready-made definition of success. And uh, we don't have to anymore because things are changing so quickly and stuff. And also about the, the lifelong learning, I, I love this MOOC thing, online learning. And I've tried it. I, I quit like three times because I couldn't catch up. <laughs> but I finally followed one. And it was like, you know, I, I made it at the, the, the uh, two hours before the deadline, things like that. But that's, that's one great way of learning. And you can learn uh, so many different things. It's not just logical thinking and computer science. You can learn about Be Beethoven, Sonata, and history, and things like that. And you know, like graphics and photography and things like, like that. And you really have so many opportunities to use the technology. And it just is a matter of the schools are you know, built in this way. The same thing as the companies are, we do it this way. Schools, classrooms don't have to look like this, I don't think. So, I mean, that's, that's the whole point of. So we can really go and look for it. Let me ask uh, some more, yeah. Uh, today, I came from the very, very small town in Tohoku. Uh, 10,000 people were there. Uh, I think the uh, Japanese, uh, Unhappiness is because of chasing the states. And then it's really fun to me to chase the youngest country, uh, chasing the oldest countries, chasing youngest country. That's we are 10 times old by, uh, 10 times older than the states. Now I'm living in a very small town. I don't lock my front door. I left my car key to go to a convenience store. But still, I'm trying to start up a organic cosmetic company there and have a meeting with Shanghai or London by Skype. We, I like this lifestyle because I like food, fresh food there that we can't taste even in Tokyo. So we, now we can choose very many lifestyles. So I sometimes doubt, ah, I'm studying at Globis in Sendai too. Mm -hmm. But I sometimes doubt their lifestyle too. They're, they're chasing American standard only, even though they, are, they have very deep and good Japanese culture. That's my opinion. Thanks. So I think that's a very good example of you know living in the local what they call local and have a very happy life. And it's, it's, it sounds like you know what you want to do and you're doing it. And I think people who do what they like to do seem to be much happier, much more kind, and seem to be great to be around. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm also from the local area of Fukuoka. And uh, I think I'll survive anyway. <laughs> I can pursue my uh, happiness of in my life, but I'm worrying about my children, actually, mm -hmm. because Fukuoka received the uh, designation of the National Strategic Zone mm -hmm. on the theme of entrepreneurship. That's fine. Mm -hmm. We enjoy the increase in the number of new businesses and also uh, diversity in corporate management and also arrival of busy reach mm -hmm. to Fukuoka. But, in, but somehow, many of those, uh, how do you say it? ambitious people find difficulty 
in the education of children. And they tend to leave Goka sometimes to Singapore or to the US or sometimes send their children to the boarding school in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. This is mainly because my, I guess the, uh, there are a few options mm -hmm. for uh, elementary school education mm -hmm. or kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a really pity because see, we, are, we receive the strategic zone designation mm -hmm. and adults are enjoying our op wider options. Mm -hmm. But what can we do about the children's education? That's uh, something in my mind. I think that uh, the infra social infrastructure is extremely important for the, the quality of life. And I know I, I hear a lot about sort of what do I do with my kids whenever I say, well, you know, so and so and so. So uh, do we have anybody who is involved in the education? I know Globus is. And Globus has been doing all sorts of things, but they're not, they are more for the professionals. So unless we do something much, much earlier, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm faculty at Globus, but I'm gonna talk in uh, my role. I work in Global HR for a Japanese company. And recently I've been working with millennials a lot awesome. to figure out what is the appeal to them for entering a Japanese company mm -hmm. and staying at a Japanese company because we've talked about recruitment, but not so much about retention. Mm -hmm. and the critical points seem to be in the first three years you have to give an opportunity for either a global assignment, working on a major project, or some way to kind of give an outlet for their creativity because the millennials care a lot about entrepreneurism and creating and creativity. And it seems to me the challenge is not so much senior management, mm -hmm. it's middle management. Mm -hmm. That the previous um, panel is called the o Osan Society, right? So how to break through that Osan layer and give people, uh, younger people, the opportunity to create and do what they want to do in the first three years, because if they don't, they'll, they'll vote with their feet and they'll go work for a different company. Do we have any ojisan? <laughs> <laughs> Generation. <laughs> okay, uh, I, sorry, I don't work for the big corporation. I used to work for in the US and also work for an Italian company, and I got uh, two pink slips in the company, and that was great. Honestly, uh, whenever you get high fired, and you, you are forced to find a new opportunity yourself. So I think the most important thing is that a big corporation, instead of giving a promotion in the inside the organization, you have to, I mean, if you work for an American company, you have to find a another job to get the salary increase or get the promotion. So that's something in Japan needed, yeah. you know. Yeah, can like parallel career and things. Can yeah. I actually make the comment about the kids, just to go back to it, because we actually have four. Two are in international, the third one's in Japanese system, and the fourth one's kind of a baby. Um, I, I really think it, there's no right answer, and we've kind of tried all different things. My husband's Japanese, so we've kind of, we want that bilingual, intercultural environment for our children. Um, what I found is every child's completely different. So no matter how hard you try to make them international, my third son the other day said, Mama, what is your Nihonjin da yo? You know, and, and he said, he made it very clear. He goes, you know, I think like a Japanese person in Japanese, he's explaining this, and you don't think like a Japanese person. It was fascinating, right? And so, but that's his perspective. Um, I, I really think it comes down to the parents just taking the lead and giving your child different opportunities. I don't know if really uh, before they're five, I, they don't really retain that. So it's nice to have Sesame Street or whatever or cl play classes. But once they start entering elementary school and junior high, you know what, send them away for the summer. You know, give them those opportunities. Make sure that if you know about foreign groups within Fukuoka, make sure they're on that soccer team. Just those little interactions, hopefully there will be more foreigners coming in. Everybody's talked about, we want Japanese people to go outside. You know, unfortunately that's going down, which is really scary that people aren't going abroad. Well, you know what, bring the foreigners in and that will start, that, that will actually get more people to probably go out as well. So I think just as a parent, you have to drive the opportunities for your child to see that world. And you know, not go on the five-day tour to Hawaii, but instead fly to Oklahoma and you know go play with sheep or something like that. You know, you have to think creatively about how to really give them um, an international environment, um, but also get them to respect and understand. It will cause them to respect and understand what is also very special about Japan, because when you go abroad, 
one of the biggest findings is, oh, I miss that in Japan, or oh, Japan is so much better in that area. So I think that's a wonderful thing. It's not just about being international, it's about appreciating your own country as well. But that's your job, and if that those situation is not available in Fukuoka, create it. Create an international group. Create something, a co-op nursery school where you share your time to raise your kids. Um, it really comes down to your values and your leadership. Go ahead. I think we have uh, four more minutes, so we'll take two questions. Okay, thank you very much. I'm also a faculty of uh, Globus University. Uh, we've been talking about uh, young people. We talked about kids, but how about the aging population? I am very worried about the growing Asian uh, population. And, and do we have any plan, well, maybe especially from the government point of view, do we have any uh, plan for opening up a labor market as part of diversity initiatives? Yeah, for the elderly. Well, uh, yes, uh, actually, um, there are two aspects. I, I think first we have to um, sort of make the local companies a little bit more productive by raising the minimum wage because before doing that, we'll have uh, less productive companies uh, using simple labor uh, as, as a foreign simple labor. That would not uh, help our economy. There, therefore, we should clean up the uh, the local uh, companies and then bring in uh, foreign labors, Mo bo both the simple labor and al also uh, the productive ones. Uh, well, uh, uh, with, with right? aging population, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm just wondering how uh, we can we can be the, the the people who can sustain our life to our death in a way that, um, so that the tax money doesn't need to support that big part of the population? Is there any discussion that, that is going? Uh, well, uh, sooner or later there, there will be a com competition between China and Japan, or uh, maybe Korea, uh, for uh, nursery care. Mm. Mm. I think, uh, I looked at uh, what the companies are doing for those over 65, because they are extended, and we didn't find too many uh, initiatives specifically addressing those, like, like it was last year. And uh, one of the things which I'm sort of hoping is that by using the technology and by having the flexible work environment, they may be able to work you know, from home rather than just full-time kind of things. That's, that doesn't help anybody, women, you know, elderly, handicapped, or whatever. So that's, uh, but there aren't that many initiatives, as far as I know, unfortunately. I, th I think it's gonna come down to private uh, companies, like something that we're looking at, and there are regulations around it, is actually um, enabling the more of the elderly female population to pick up the kids at the Hoikwen, take care of them in their neighborhoods until the moms can come home. So at the Hoikwen we attend, there's actually quite a few of these independent people who do that. And for a working mom to pay 1,800 yen or 2,500 yen an hour, it's just not feasible to a corporation. But if you can find, quote unquote, a babysitter, and they're these wonderful you know, women who have raised their children, but you have to enable that with technology. So the moms, like us, are very technical. We would love to go online, but you actually have to, there's an element of education and getting those women, make sure they have some basic training and whatnot. So I think that there are certain littler companies who are starting to work on things like that. And so I, I think that's a great movement that I'm starting to see, and that's one segment, but you'll probably see the other thing for house cleaning and cooking and other services to support these busy families. And I'm really excited about that for the elderly population. You had a question. Can you make it pretty brief? So yeah, uh, my question might be off topic, but uh, I, I really understand how actually new work style will, how to say, make us again a, a benefit. Mm. Uh, however, my concern is to younger generation. Nowadays, one of that cannot, cannot work as a regular employee. And then if they miss the opportunity to be a regular employee, they, they won't be able to change the situation. So how should we change with new work 
work style and also labor market and delegation. That is my concern and question. Anybody wants to take it? That's a big topic. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a big topic at the end, and I'm not really sure whether, uh, because this is uh, all those uh, young people without any regular jobs, but that assumes the regular jobs are the thing of the future, which I think we have challenged. So, go ahead. Well, just, just very brief. Um, you would have to define what, what is regular job. I mean, if it's a membership job, or if it's a job uh, uh, described, um, in other words, what you do is described pre precisely, then it's easier. If it's a, a quasi white or wh white collar job, which is called membership, and if, if you enter a membership of certain uh, corporations, that you certain corporations only have certain lots for membership, because by definition, you don't want to have so many memberships because if, if you're not, ha, ha, if you don't have that much revenue. So th it, it is difficult uh, for uh, Japanese, but it's also difficult for any uh, men, men and women from any country to have this membership job. But um, if you're not looking for a membership uh, passport, then it, it's, it's, it's not that difficult. I mean, uh, I, I know that you, uh, a lot of the Japanese young Japanese want to have this membership. Mm. But membership, if you want to enter a membership, that's also you have a lot of responsibility. Mm. And also, uh, it, it might be tough. I mean, you might have to work, even if you're work, uh, working at Amazon for a long time, mm. right, and long hours. Mm. So, so it might not be, you know, it might not uh, be equal to your happiness. Since we, are, we ran out of time already, I'm just gonna close the session, but I think, I hope, that you have at least some picture of the positive elements of this change. Because as we talked about change, we are in the, in the, the, the era of change. A very rapid and many drastic technological changes taking place, so as demographics. And that's a great opportunity. That could be a threat, but at the same time, that could be an opportunity to break through something. And I think we have as we mentioned, many different kinds of services and platforms which offer more opportunities. So you, I would really like you to grab it, to take a look at it and grab it. Thank you very much.